I would uh, ask you to remain standing as you turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, book of Revelation chapter 3. We continue to look at these letters to the church's little epistles that read like epistles to these churches, but with this glorious, weighty preface that we found in chapters 1 and 2, that Christ, as the one who is upon the throne, is the one who speaks and has written. And these things are recorded not only for the church in Philadelphia this morning, but for us as well. I follow along as I read chapter two, uh, chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, <clears throat> I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell upon the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thus far, the reading of God's words, you may be seated. Let me pray now for the blessing of the preaching of it. O oh Lord, may we take confidence in you who are the keeper of the gate, the door through whom all men must go if they desire salvation. For you, O oh Lord, have laid open the door for those who love you. And there is no power in heaven or on earth that is able to shut that door. And we who are your children are free, free from the condemnation of the wicked, free from the suffering of those who wish to separate us from your love. Oh Lord, make us a people who are grounded, who have confidence and courage and strength, not in what we see, but what we are told in your word. And so may we not judge by feeble sense, but may we be strengthened with the eyes of faith, O Lord, this morning. In your presence and by your power, we ask all of this. Amen. Uh, we come to the sixth letter as Christ delivers to the church, the church in Philadelphia and also the other churches on that circuit of delivery and to the church today and in every age, past, present, and future. These significant truths that are related to something that is wholly unique to Christ. These are things that Christ can only say of himself or things that are said of Christ. It can only be true of him. Each of these letters has this glorious preface, something to do with the character and action of Christ that is the foundation for either the rebuke or exhortation or combination of the two or one. Sometimes we have only rebuke, sometimes we have only commendation, and sometimes we have both, depending on the health of the church. This morning, Christ has only good things to say to the church in Philadelphia, and that is directly tied to their faithfulness, a faithfulness that is observable by Christ, and so he commends them for it. And so as Christ is delivering 
to the church in Philadelphia a message he wishes for them to know that he is the king that sits upon the throne of David, David's son and David's Lord, that he is the great steward of the house of God. And as steward, who controls who comes in and who goes, or who does not come in, rather, he is the eternal sovereign of heaven and earth. Christ is the arbiter of those who are and who are not members of the household of faith. And the confidence that we have as those who confess Christ is that through Christ we gain entry and no one can keep us out. No one. And so we are to live in light of this glorious truth for the promise of those who endeavor to endure patiently even unto the end is that we will become a permanent fixture in the household of God. We will be part of the architecture. That is the great promise. There's three points that I want to make this morning. And much like the introduction or the synopsis that I'll put in an email, sometimes it's a bit more cryptic than others, uh, the outline is also something that is composed at the beginning of the week, and sometimes it changes. And this morning, I have three points. They're all very similar, except for the first one. Three points this morning. The words of the divine steward. The words of the divine steward. Second, faithfulness and power. And then thirdly, living stones. So it's just the first one that's different. The words of the divine steward. Let's look at that point. This morning, Christ opens this letter and to the angel, messenger, pastor of the church in Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One, that is Christ, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. I want you to think, kids, of a castle, of a kingdom. That kingdom represents, or the castle represents the kingdom. And in that castle, there is a door. And that door is often a strong door. It is made with thick wood and large metal bars. That door is meant to be, though it is not, almost as strong as the stones that are around it. The kingdom of Christ is a city. It is a castle. It is, a, it is that which is guarded by a wall, and there is a door. I want you to think of a big door. And in the coming of Christ and his death, and burial, and resurrection, and in his ascension, you will remember Christ said, it is better that I go, and I will send a helper. This is the Holy Spirit. Now, why it is better is so that the age of the Holy Spirit may come. And the age of the Holy Spirit is one in which the door of that castle, the door of the kingdom of God, is flung open for the elect. And what was and seemed in the Old Testament like a trickle has become a rushing tide of spirit-wrought global transformation. And for 2,000 years, there is no power on earth that has been able to stop the rising tide of the kingdom of Christ. And there have been powers that have tried. Now, I think what we're learning to do in this country is we are learning to adjust to the reality that there are those in power who cannot abide the eternal power of Christ Jesus. And yet every nation, every power that is not righteous in its character has sought to overthrow the expression of Christ's power on earth. And I would say to those people, bring it on. Now, you can say that while being burned alive at the stake. You can say that while you're winning. You can say it while you're losing. Because Christ's kingdom will, in the end, take utter and absolute dominion over all things in such a way that every person will say, oh, he's in charge. He's the king. Not that king. Christ is the king. And there is a very real reason for that. It is what is read here. It is what Christ says of himself. I am the holy one, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens uh, the, the door and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. Christ is holy, infinite, and eternal in his holiness. 
It cannot change. The word we use for that, kids, is immutable. If you want to impress your parents, which is really what it's all about, right? Go home and say, I learned the word immutable. And you can say, that means I never stop talking. You can't ever mute me. Now, that's not what it means. <laughs> it kind of sounds like that, doesn't it? <laughs> Words are tricky sometimes. N it, it, you can say, I never change in that I don't ever stop talking. That's what immutable means. Christ is unchangeable in his holiness, and he is incapable of lying. The opposite is true of men, right? They can't ever stop lying. In the same way that even when we do something that is righteous, there is always, even as our confession says, some sinfulness intermingled with it. And it is only because of Christ that our works are accepted as righteous before the Father. And so Christ is writing to this, this little church in Philadelphia. They're experiencing persecution. They're experiencing persecution at the hands of those who say, no, we are the true church. Which in essence does what to the Christian? The Judaizers were saying, slam the door. You're not part of the true church. Christ is writing to the church in Philadelphia and says, I've opened the door, and no one is going to close that which I have opened, and no one can open that which I have closed. What Christ is giving us here is a framework for how we can view these two connected elements within the doctrine of the decrees of God that we call election and reprobation. Election is the decree of God as to who is or who are his children, the elect, are those who are eternally chosen before the creation, those who would be God's children. The reprobate are those who were not chosen or chosen not to be the children of God. And the one in whom those things are made true is the door who is Christ Jesus. You are chosen in Christ or not. You either enter in through Christ or you are not allowed to enter. The gate is shut. And for all who reject Christ as the door, the only way of salvation, to them the way is closed. Now the reason why this is true is because Christ is also the son of David. Your Old Testament is very important. Read your Old Testament. I just got finished saying this to my middle school level Bible survey class. If you don't know the Old Testament, you do not understand the reason for Christ's coming. Maybe you've heard of the pastor Andy Stanley. He wants you to unhitch your life from the Old Testament. And I'm thinking, what? Why? First of all, how? How? How do you do that? And not only not have an organized society, but how do you have a life? How do you know what's good? Well, obviously, there's much of that in the New Testament. But what you find in the Old Testament is this glorious first act that leads to the context and the greater glory of the New Testament. And what we learn of Christ, who calls himself the son of David, which you would never understand, if you unhitch the Old Testament from your Christian faith, is that Christ is the true king of heaven and earth. Israel is the center of everything. Now, when I say Israel, I mean the whole nation, that eternal people of God, not just the historic nation state of Israel, but Christ's people. Christ will, through his people, rule and reign upon the earth. That is the promise given to David and David's son, who is Christ Jesus. Now, this is what Pastor Doug Wilson says in his commentary. He's got a great, simple commentary. It's on that little biography or bibliography I gave you. The name of the, the book is When the Man Comes Around, which is a clever title. This is what he writes. There, he's speaking of Christ, 
As a faithful steward, the key of the house of David would be laid upon his shoulder. When he opened something, no one could shut it. When he shut and locked something, no one could open it. He would be permanently settled. As such, this Eliakim, Eliakim is an Old Testament righteous steward of the kingdom of Israel. This Eliakim is a type of Lord Jesus. Jesus is the steward of all human history, having replaced a treacherous steward that is the devil. This is what Christ's ministry on earth, his death, burial, and resurrection, and his ascension have earned him. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Uh, yesterday, we were at a basketball game, and one of the parents um, acted out a little bit. And they stormed off, and they pulled their kid out of the game in the middle of the game. And, of course, all the other parents are going, are you going to do something about this? Are you going to? No, we're all just sort of sitting there waiting. What are the refs going to do? And then after that sort of situation had been resolved, one of the referees was over in the corner, and he was sort of venting to the parents. And he said, I can't believe he's acting this way. This is the Lord's campus. I thought, oh, the Lord gets a campus. That's, that's really great. There is no place on earth where you cannot say, this is not the Lord's. Even Washington, D.C. <laughs> right? Some people may say that of Gastonia, right? You live in Gastonia? Yes, even Gastonia. Even, name it, name a place. Philadelphia, 2,000 years ago, is Christ's. It is all his. It is all well within the boundaries of his kingdom. And so it falls within his purview to rule and reign faithfully. This is our king, which means what? Even if Caesar does not admit it, Caesar is under the authority of Christ. And Christ's patience towards you, towards me, towards Caesar is the only thing that prevents him from bringing judgment upon all of mankind. And he is right to do so because we deserve wrath. But God, Christ, is one who opens and closes, not just closes. Thanks be to God. He controls the door. And as steward of the house of God, he opens and closes according to the counsels of his will and not the counsels of men. For in your anger, how often would you close the door? <laughs> Do you know what that means? Children, this is why we say, don't take the Lord's name in vain. You know which word I'm talking about. That pronouncement of judgment belongs only to Christ Jesus. He controls the door. He is, even as Christ said, I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. His power is utterly and completely absolute. And the reason why this is important to the church in Philadelphia and to any church suffering persecution is because what other powers want to tell you is, no, 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 no. We control. Christ says, I'll take that. Thank you very much. That's mine. And no one can take it. It's his. It's his authority. And so that leads then to the second point. This acknowledgement of what is true of Christ, this testimony of his faithfulness, of his holiness. He is trustworthy. He is worthy of our confidence. He then takes that and applies it. Look at verse 8. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door. Christ is saying to the saints in Philadelphia, the door is open. I say it's open, but there will be a party that says otherwise. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, here are the people that want to close the door. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. The kingdom of God is a city. It is a dwelling place. 
Christ controls the gate, the door. Men, in their arrogance and in their pride and in their idolatry, this is what they do. They see that gate and they go, let's see if we can climb the wall or, or dig a hole or, or carve through the wall. Christ confronts these kinds of people in the Gospels and he says they are thieves and they try to climb over the gate, but there's no way to do that. That's Babel, right? That's Western culture or the kind of Western culture that says man is the measure of all things. Not good culture. It's not culture at all, is it? It's just idolatry. It's the spirit of Babel. And the way in which we look at the world around us, much of what they were dealing with in Philadelphia is not unlike what we are dealing with now. And we are dealing with a group of people, a systematized expression that says man is the arbiter of truth. And so whatever you name it, that's its name. So kids, good news. You can go home, and if you don't have a cat and you have two dogs, you can call them cats, and now they're cats. That's the world in which we live. Parents, I encourage you to try that. And your children will look at you and laugh. You cannot be something which God has not made you. That is the expanded application of, of Christ is sovereign. If Christ is sovereign and is king, he gets to set the terms. He defines things. And there is a group of people that is also in Philadelphia, and what they're saying to the church is, you are not part of the body. You are not bound for glory. You are not the true children of God. And Christ says to Philadelphia, I know you don't have a lot of power. You don't have a lot of wealth. You have very little influence. And so the temptation is to do what when you're little? To cower in the face of the powerful, the wealthy, the strong, and the mighty. But are we really weak? We're, we're not a big church. But we do have the backing of the king of heaven and earth, which means something. It certainly means a lot more than numbers. It means a lot more than tithe and money. It means a lot more than social influence, though we want those things. It's not wrong to want those things. And there are some churches in history who have had those things, and they have put them to very good use. It's hard to send missionaries if you can't pay them. It's hard to train ministers for the gospel if you can't support them. All of those things are essential, but they are not gate-opening and closing things. Christ alone does that. And what Christ commends Philadelphia for is this. You've made the most with what you've had. I know that you have but little, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. They have not given in to peer pressure. And boy, can peer pressure be powerful. And not just for the young, even for the old. And when I say peer pressure, I don't mean nanny, nanny, boo, boo, Jimmy is a Christian. I mean, you will lose your job if you confess Christ. That's adult peer pressure. It's the kind of peer pressure that makes you long for the playground when you got called names. Just recently in Eritrea, a church with which we have some connection in our presbytery in particular because of Zacharias, who is a refugee from Eritrea. One of the pastors was killed while in prison. You know, gas is expensive right now. This is what we're dealing with. The level of difficulty is a, it's a wide scale. And there will be many who say, oh, man, church on Sunday night? I don't know. That's pretty hardcore. How about if you miss church, you don't go to prison? If you do, you go to prison. Now, that's hardcore. And not just go to church, but with one of these. 
with a smile and a cheerful heart. Remember the apostles who sang in prison because they counted it a joy? What Philadelphia is doing is they're making the most with what they have. And they have very little. And you know who controls what they have? The very same one who says later on, I will allow you not to suffer in ways that other churches may even suffer because you have been faithful. Christ controls all of this. And if Christ controls all of it, then why ought we not say, I will leave to Christ the things that are his. I will but be faithful in what he has commanded me to do. It is faithfulness in the midst of persecution, and it doesn't require strength, not the kind of strength the world calls strength. You don't have to be wealthy. You don't have to be wise in the eyes of the world. You don't have to be powerful or admired or feared. You just need to listen to the voice of Christ over all the other voices and not deny his name. So look at verse 9. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews. Here, Jews, not meaning Old Testament people of God, but the true Israel. Those of true faith. They say they are, but they're not. They lie. And what I will do is I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Faithfulness results in the exaltation of the faithful. Christ says this to us. And the reason why we can take this to the bank is because Christ is holy and true. He cannot lie. And not only can he not lie, it would be one thing for Christ to say, I promise I'm going to try and make this happen. What Christ promises happens. It may not happen when we want it to happen, but it does happen. He is trustworthy and true. They will come and they will see they were wrong and you were right. Or perhaps more to the point that I am the door and that they chose the right door. They entered the right way or you as he's speaking to the saints. Verse 10. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will come or I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. Christ can make these promises. He can grant us these assurances because Christ is the one who brings everything. He is the decreer. And I will say this. If there is a God who is wholly sovereign over all things, who is infinite and eternal in his being, wisdom, justice, goodness, holiness, truth, or however that order goes in the shorter catechism. It's better to be his friend than to be his enemy. It is better to be at peace with that king than to be at odds with him. And Christ is expressing the manner in which we are made at peace or have peace with this king. And that is what? Obey. Believe, endure, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep from you the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. That leads me to my third point, living stones. Let's look at that one. If Christ can transform weakness and suffering into glory and triumph, surely, surely he is sovereign over the things that the church experiences and as a reward for the faithfulness of Philadelphia, Christ is saying to them, there is a coming persecution that you will avoid. Now, Christ does not make this promise to every church. And sometimes suffering is the reward for faithfulness. Sometimes suffering is the inevitable result of faithfulness because the church in Sardis didn't suffer because they didn't look different from the world. They were like the world. They had been compromised. And so too did the church in Laodicea. But there between Sardis and Laodicea is this little church in Philadelphia. And Christ says to them, because, verse 10, you have been faithful, I will keep you from an hour of trial that is coming. Now this hour of trial 
it's a little bit more difficult here to discern when and what that is, but we do find in verse 11 this qualifying statement, I am coming soon. Now, this coming soon, as I have said earlier in the book of Revelation, does not refer to the second coming of Christ that hasn't happened yet. But the coming of Christ, when he brings judgment against Israel and the destruction of the temple, and at that time, and before that time, and even after the destruction of the temple for a while, the Christian church was persecuted by Jews and the Roman Empire. Christ is saying, I will free you from that persecution. To what extent? It is not clear. But this is what is clear. Persecution is part of the sovereignty of Christ Jesus. It happens or doesn't happen based upon his decrees. It is not the result of what men do to us. It is primarily the result of what Christ has decreed. This is how he is the doorkeeper. His authority goes all the way to the top. You understand what I mean by that? In our political system, there are certain levels. There are checks and balances. A county gets trumped by state. State gets trumped by federal. Those types of things. In terms of hierarchy of authority. Christ is not some county commissioner that says, listen, I'm going to try to get you out of some suffering. Let me work on that. And then he goes over here, and someone higher up the chain says, no, suffering is coming. Christ is the authority that all other authorities appeal to for their authority, even if they don't admit it, which means this. Caesar can do nothing that does not pass through the hand of Christ and that is not directly controlled by Christ Jesus. And that should give you and me greater hope than, boy, I hope Christ comes through for me in the end. I'm really banking on it. Cross your fingers, which is blasphemous. Frankly, it's probably not something to even joke about, which I'm not endeavoring to do. I'm trying to present to you oftentimes the sort of practical approach we have to how God's sovereignty works which is why this idea about pre-mill versus post-mill versus all-mill, have you heard the joke, I'm a pan-mill, everything will just pan out in the end? That's the most dishonoring view. Because all you're saying is, Christ will do something, right? Christ is doing something, and we ought not to be flippant. The reason why a small church with little power can stand up to a big group is because We're bigger than they are. We always have been. When Abraham was called and his wife Sarah, they were already a, well, the superpower on earth. They just haven't grown into it yet. Remember what Christ says of the kingdom? The kingdom starts like a little mustard seed. It's imperceptible. It's just a handful of people afraid in the upper room. Oh, but then Christ pours out the miracle grow of the Holy Spirit. I don't mean to offend you, you know, all natural organic types. It's just a metaphor. The superpower of the church, what has happened is that mustard seed is becoming, as Christ has promised, the largest seed in the garden. I don't think we're there yet. We're getting there, but we're not there yet because I think we'll be very clear when we are. Philadelphia is 2,000 years in the past in this promise. And they believed it. And so Christ says what? Hold fast. The promise of the divine steward is that they will come to you and they will say, Christ is the door. And in the same way, I don't think Christ is only referring to a future coming or a distant future coming. I think also this realization of the world coming to the church and admitting that Christ is, that we are on Christ's side is also something that happens. When people come to know Christ, what do they confess? Christ is the Lord. Christ is the Lord. And who 
carries that confession around in their, their chests and it causes their hearts to beat. It is the members of the church. And so Christ gives that promise that the world will come and they will see that I have loved you. I will preserve you from suffering. And then 11, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The crown is that promise of glory now of a future glory. And that promise of glory is given to all the members of the visible church so long as they endure. And if they endure and are obedient as Christ is, they will be given a crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Kids, have you ever gotten the opportunity to sign your name in wet concrete? Put your hand in it. Why do you do that? Well, I don't know. Why do you play in a sandbox? To make a mess? No, it's to, it is to establish, you understand, if I put my hand in this wet concrete, my hand will be there forever. It will be there in perpetuity. I can make my mark on the world. So intimately connected to the church, to the holy church, the heavenly temple, are those who are the true children of God. We are in the architecture of it. We are the living embodiment of the temple of Christ Jesus. And the reward is so great is that not only are we those who go into the door, we are, we become the house. Christ makes of himself, his body, a holy edifice that is a trophy that he wears that expresses to the Father the glory of his people. That is what the new heavens and the new earth will be like. We belong there. And it will be for most all of us the first time we feel like we finally belonged because sin will be no more and death will be gone and even hell will be destroyed. Or at least the judgment of Christ. All those who are wicked will be cast out. There will be no um, threat of rebellion again. So, never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven in my own new name. It will be made living stones. And what is the alternative? Well, we sang about it, didn't we? It is to be cast out in utter darkness. If you're trying to walk around the house, what do you do? Turn the light on. And when you turn that light on, if your house is well kept, you get to admire the beautiful things, the pictures, the architecture. All of it is made evident. We are told in the New Testament that Christ is the light of that place. He is the sun, and the radiance of the glory of Christ is what will reveal the beauty of the house, and in Christ's light, our glory will be displayed. It will be an experience of mutual delight and satisfaction that the God had enjoyed for all eternity. No one turns the light on in hell. There's nothing to admire. There's no glory, there's no beauty, there's no peace, there's no sun. And the people who will go there endeavor to tell the church how to be run here. And you know what they want to do? They want to go back to that wall, they want to turn off the lights, and they want you to leave. That's what the world wants. And Christ says, that's not the way it's going to happen. I get to open the door. I get to close it. And I am the light. Let's pray. Lord, I God.